Okay, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, the number of days of sales and receivables is an estimate of time and days that the accounts receivable have been outstanding. And the number of days of sales and receivables is usually compared with the company's credit terms to evaluate how efficient they are at collecting those receivables. We do not want the number of days in sales to be longer than the actual credit terms because that means we are having trouble collecting from our customers and we may have to change our credit terms. Here's an example exercise. So you can pause the video, take a moment, work this, and then check your answers and then we'll continue. Inventory analysis is a company's ability to manage its inventory effectively. So we have two ratios we're going to look at, inventory turnover and number of days of sales in inventory. So what does excess inventory do? It decreases the liquidity by tying up funds because we have inventory sitting around and that is money. It also uh, causes increase in insurance expense, property taxes, storage costs, and other related expenses because we have to have somewhere to store this inventory. It increases the risk of losses because of the price decline or obsolescence of the inventory. You have to find just the right amount of inventory to have so we don't lose sales but we don't want extra inventory lying around. The inventory turnover ratio is going to tell us the number of times a company sells its merchandise inventory, its average level of merchandise inventory during the year. And to calculate this, you're going to take cost of merchandise sold, which is found on the income statement, and you're going to divide it by average merchandise inventory. Remember, we did this earlier beginning balance of inventory, ending balance of inventory, add those together and divide by two. Remember inventory can be found on the balance sheet. Okay, so here we're calculating the inventory turnover for Lincoln Company. So the cost of merchandise sold, let me just show you where that 1,043,000 came from. That comes from your income statement right here. For 2016 for 2015 it's right here and then your average inventory we've already calculated before so you will divide cost of merchandise sold by the average inventory and for 2016 you get 3.8 and for 2015 you get 2.8 and just to make sure that you could get those two numbers for inventory, um, the beginning of the year would be 283, and the end of the year would be 264 for 2016. For 2015, we would have to go back another year to get the 311. But you would get these from the balance sheet, or either they would give you the beginning and ending year balances for each year. So in accounting, whenever you see average, you're going to do the beginning of the year plus the end of the year divided by two. And you will only average balance sheet accounts. You will not average income statement accounts. So I'm selling my inventory 3.8 times during the year, whereas in 2015, I uh, sold it 2.8 times. So I have improved, but I really need to compare my number to the industry average to see how I'm doing uh, compared to the industry. Now, if you want to dig even deeper into your inventory, you can look at the number of days sales in inventory. What this does is measure the average number of days merchandise inventory is held by the company. So basically it's telling me how many days on average it's taking me to sell my inventory. 
So what you do is you take the average merchandise inventory, beginning balance plus ending balance divided by two, and then you're going to take the average daily cost of merchandise sold. So you take the cost of merchandise sold, remember that is on the income statement, see that number 1,043,820,000? Those are your cost of merchandise sold. So if you want to you want to take that and divide it by 365 and that's going to give you your denominator. So here they computed it for 2016 and 2015. Got the average inventory. Got the average cost of merchandise sold average daily cost that's why it's divided by 365 and it tells you the number of days of sales in inventory so it looks like we're selling the inventory a lot better in 2016 and then in 2015 in 2016 it's taking us we're holding it for 95.7 days we're not holding it as long as we did last year and that could be for a number of reasons that it improved. Um, but we also need to compare our number to the industry. So here is the example exercise. Pause the video, work this, and check your answers with the answer at the bottom. And then we'll continue. Okay, now we're going to look at some solvency ratios. Remember, this is the ability to pay long-term debts. So your long-term creditors and bondholders are going to want to look at these ratios to see if a company is able to repay the face amount of the bond or the debt at maturity and is the company able to make periodic interest payments. So the first ratio that we're going to look at um, is going to be the ratio of fixed assets to long-term liabilities. We also are going to look at ratio of liabilities to stockholders' equity, and we're going to look at times interest earned. So the ratio of fixed assets to long-term liabilities, so here this is going to tell us how much fixed assets do we have to support our long-term debt. So this is going to be how quickly or how much are we able to repay the face amount of debt at maturity? Um, so we're going to do fixed assets divided by your long-term liabilities. So here we have our fixed assets and we have our long-term liabilities and we're going to divide. So here this 4.4 means we have 4.4 times we have 4.4 times more fixed assets than we do long term liabilities um, another way to say it is for every dollar of long term liability we have we have 4.4 dollars of fixed assets okay so you want this number to be greater than one for sure and you can see that um, we're able to cover our liabilities here well in both okay um, so it's just going to depend and we want to compare this to the industry to see how we're doing but you definitely want to be able to cover your long-term liabilities so both of these will be found on the balance sheet You'll divide those and you'll compare this to your industry average. Okay, for the ratio of liabilities to stockholders' equity, um, this is also called the debt-to-equity ratio because you take your total liabilities, which is your debt, and you divide it by your equity. This is going to indicate the margin of safety for creditors. So here, total liabilities, that would be on the balance sheet. Total stockholders' equity, 
would be on the balance sheet as well. Let me see if I can go back up. It would also be on the statement of stockholders equity. Let's see, that's just the assets. Let me see if I can quickly find our balance sheet. Okay, here we go. So total stockholders equity, you can see it right here, 829.5. I'll even circle it because I have a lot highlighted. Okay, going back to, here we are. So that's how you can find both of these on the balance sheet. So when you divide, you get 0.4 here and 0.6 here. And here's your practice exercise to work and check. And then we will look at times interest earned. And this is sometimes called the coverage ratio. It tells us the risk that interest payments will not be made if earnings decrease. So you're going to take your income before income tax, which is on the income statement, plus your interest expense. And then you're going to divide it by your interest expense. All of this will come off of the income statement. Um, so income before taxes is used in computing the times interest earned. Interest expense is paid before income taxes, and that, so that's why. So interest expense is deducted in determining taxable income and income tax. So really what I want you to know is the higher the ratio here, the more likely that interest payments will be paid even if earnings decrease. So here is the calculation. Income before income tax expense. Here it is, 162.5. 134.6 and then let me go back okay and then your interest expense was also on the income statement so you can get that off of there so when you divide When you add back your interest expense, you will get 168.5, and then you will divide that by your interest expense. And so here, it's higher than here, which is good, because the higher it is, the more likely we're going to be able to pay our interest expense, even if earnings decrease. But we would also need to compare that to the industry average. Here is an example for you to look at and work and then check with the answers. And let me know if you have any questions on that. And then we're going to look at, in the next video, profitability ratios.